Welcome everybody to the Learn Full Show. I'm Lowell, a serial entrepreneur, startup advisor, and your host for the show. Uh, every week we discover and speak with expert scientists and leaders from around the world. Today we're joined in our longevity series with Lisa Kaiser. I screwed up. You <laughs> just answer how to say the second part. I think it's Fabini, <laughs> and uh, CEO of Sense. Everyone just clicked off for that, I bet. CEO of Sense, a aging longevity research foundation. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you like this type of thing, because you know it's nice. I like to engage with people. Uh, welcome to the show, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I, I I think I rebounded and got Fabini right at the end, but I, I definitely didn't get it mm -hmm. on the first pass. The um in the age end of aging disease conference in 2022, uh, you talk about breaking ground in the Bay Area for a new research facility. And so I'm wondering, as someone who's from the Midwest, why have you abandoned the Midwest? Why not build something out here? Well, I didn't start the company, so that's probably <laughs> yeah. the big. That's probably the biggest the biggest bit. Um, and breaking ground is a little um too literal. I think we didn't, we wanted hmm. to get a new building and like a full building or build a building. Um, but honestly, like our organization has been from the get go, we're smaller. We put most hmm. of our money over 50% of our budget into our research. And while having a larger research facility would help our research doing that in the Bay area is just so expensive. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure we had enough money to actually move the research forward than spending it on a large building. So we just doubled our size, which is still nice in the same locations. So we just, we rent space in Mountain View in a laboratory that we've mm -hmm. been at since 2011, I believe is when we moved into that building. And um, we started actually in Arizona back in 2009. Mm -hmm. And then when we opened our first facility, it was a really tiny one room lab space in Sunnyvale, California. And they moved up there because our CEO at the time, uh, Michael Cope, lived there. And also because Peter Thiel was one of our biggest supporters and he was also in the Bay Area. We had a lot of supporters in the Bay Area. It's a really great hub for innovation, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, it, however, the cost of living is sky high. So when you're talking about why, why abandon the Midwest, well, we never were in the Midwest. We were always on mm. the West Coast. However... I'm trying to get us actually into the Midwest. There's a lot of money um, from the government, from state governments for um, biological innovation. Um, if you bring your company to this area, in fact, we have one of our somewhat spinoffs, one of our people who started our education program, actually, uh, Dr. Kelsey Moody started a company in New York, in Syracuse, New York upstate called i Therapeutics. And he moved there because mm -hmm. one, he's from New York and two, the innovation, um, like bonuses that the state give you were just phenomenal. And so he moved his company there and they've really been blossoming and doing great work. Um, and he and I had worked together prior to SRF as well. We'd worked together for a long time and I actually helped him a little bit get set up in Syracuse at the very, very beginning. Um, but anyway, so I'm thinking, we're thinking about opening a secondary location somewhere in the Midwest. And we're looking in Ohio, we're looking in D Indiana, Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania, specifically the Midwest because of those bonuses from the government, but also because the cost of living is so much lower and yeah. because we're having a hard time finding people, like finding good people to come work for us. When COVID hit, it was hard, but it was actually a little bit of a boon because we were able to, we, we made to keep our researchers safe. We made our entire research facility only researchers. Normally our, all of our staff was in-house. Um, but we kicked everybody else out when COVID happened so that we could do social distancing and keep our researchers safe and keep our research going. And knock on wood, we've never had an outbreak of COVID in our facility ever, which was great. Um, but it made us, so all of our admin and outreach and education staff went remote. And so when we started hiring, we grew significantly. Mm -hmm. we, we added on about 50% <clears throat> more staff um, since our big fundraising event with the airdrop. So um we were able to hire everywhere. We we didn't, we said, if you were admin, outreach, education, we'll hire you anywhere. You can work remote, remotely. And that really helped us find great people. But with our researchers, we can't do that. You can't be like, hey, you can work anywhere, but we need you in the lab Monday through Friday and sometimes on weekends in Mountain mm -hmm. View. But the cost of living is so high and we're a nonprofit. We don't pay the best rates. We try to make up for it in benefits and things, but we can't compete with some of the big tech people or with Calico, right? We're just not going to be able to do that. Um, and it's really hard to get people to move to the Bay to, to like live, especially people who have families or who want to have families. It's, it's just impossible. And so eventually we're going to need to expand again. Our current facility is 11,000 square feet, maybe 11 and a half thousand square feet. Um, and it's good for us now 
but it's not going to be good for us probably in another three to five years. We're going to need more space. Um, and the reason we're not just picking up and moving to the Midwest is because we have a lot of really amazing scientists that are working for us in the Bay Area who don't want to leave and we don't want to make them leave. Um, but we might, instead of, we can't afford to expand again. So we might open up a new facility in the Midwest and we're looking into that tentatively so that we can attract more and better talent and also reduce the cost of living. That's a long-winded yeah. answer for why not the Midwest. <laughs> No, but, it sounds like the Midwest is a, is is the option. The, I, I wonder this all the time, and it's it's one of the for long time listeners. You know, like I'll ask people who are doing sell ag, like why aren't you building something in the Midwest? And by the end, if they're like, no, I should probably build something in the Midwest because the for that eleven thousand square feet in the Bay Area, you could probably own a palace out here. Like it's just the most state of the art, massive facility that would be even more square feet, more things you can do, and the the talent you can like yeah. the talent is great wherever you are. Like Madison, I like Madison personally in Chicago, but I like Madison more than I Chicago because Madison's Madison. kind of like Boston. Yeah. I love Madison. It's a beautiful city. Yeah. Um, I have a friend in Madison who's been asking me to move to Madison. <laughs> but mm. I love Chicago. But um, I'm actually around Cleveland. And That's in great. Cleveland, we have Case Western, which is an amazing institution. We also have the Cleveland Clinic, which is world mm. renowned for its its heart center. And we do a lot of work in cardiac. So um we're also looking at a partnership with University of Toledo. So Ohio is not a bad idea either. And there's a lot of, there used to be a lot of biotech, um, not a lot considering like Austin or Boston or um, the Bay, but there was a fair amount of biotech in um, South of Cleveland a little bit. So um, we're, we're looking, I mean, I, I have a preference for Ohio, but I'm not going to make my preference everybody's preference. So we're doing, we're doing our homework and we have some friends, um, some other independent research institutions in Indiana and in Pennsylvania that have offered us lab space, um, who have core facilities, who wouldn't need to purchase outright um, new capital expenditures, which can be expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of our microscopes in the Bay are hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's just the, the cost of doing business, essentially, to get the good data that you need to get to move your research forward. So yeah. it's it's all up in the air, but I, I love the Midwest. I think it's great. I also like that um, the traffic is not nearly as bad as the Bay. Mm -hmm. It is a nice feature. The the uh, Door County, I don't know if you've ever been in Wisconsin, there's like a little part called Door County. And it's like being in New England, but without the people. It's really nice. I, anyone who just heard that, don't come up here. Don't don't go there. <laughs> it's just it's for the Midwesterners. And the cheese is great. But, uh, the cheese I, is great. Yeah, I, I, it's not, I get the impression that you've never heard of Door County, so I recommend you know Googling that. It's pretty cool. It's like, it's literally like, you know, like the fall leaves in New England that people talk about? It's like, yeah. it's like, it's like that, but in the Midwest. So the cost is like a third. Like for me, for my and my family to go out to the New England, New the, to New England, uh, it'd be like you know several thousand dollars to just drive up to uh, Door County. It'd be like five hundred. It's like nothing. Well, you also never want to drive to New England. The roads. I drove once in Boston, and it was an experience that I never want to have again. So anyone who's mm -hmm. like, yeah, let's. I mean, I once drove to new england and got lost and ended up in rhode island somehow and i wasn't sure how that's crazy so yeah one one time i drove from iowa to boston in one day and i did it when there was a hurricane hitting and no one told me the entire 18 20 hours i was on the road and then on the way back uh my wife who was with me at the time was sleeping in the back and uh and I was like, man, this is all the area where people talk about like X Files, where aliens happen. And all, out of nowhere, there's like a like a light that's coming down from the sky, and I'm freaking out because you know, like she's sleeping, and I'm like, oh, am I seeing an alien? Am I really this sleepy? And then I get closer, I get closer, and it's just a car coming down from a mountain. It was like this is so weird. I'm from I'm from the plains. I'm not used to these hills. It, like really scared me. Uh, but yeah. So in, ter in terms of like a serious question, before people get uh, mad at me in the comment section, uh, you talked about the benefits in the Midwest, like people like uh, coming out. Um, what are some of those benefits that the states offer? I, I'm not familiar with this. So they do, um, sometimes they'll do a tax break. Sometimes they'll do um, like a significant tax break for new in, for new biotech coming in. But a lot of times they give you like um, monetary incentives. Like they will give you grants to open mm. up facilities. Um, and it's not chump change. It's like significant money that would help get us situated in, in the Midwest. And some states offer more than others. Um, so we're going to have to look and see how that plays out. And sometimes you have to have somebody who is a resident of the state 
So that matters too. Um, I'm a resident of Ohio right now. We have somebody in Maryland. We had somebody in Illinois. I don't think we still do. So we would have to look into that. But a lot of it's just monetary compensation and tax breaks mm. and tax cuts. Um, sometimes I've even heard of people offering um, the states basically paying your rent for a number of years to get you okay. in. Yeah. So it it really depends. But we're, look, we're looking into it to see what kind of um, benefits we can get that would help our organization. But it, it probably wouldn't be for another three to five years because we don't need additional space right now. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is being closer to the East Coast helps because we are a global um, organization. I mean, we're obviously U.S. based. We're based in California. We're incorporated in California, but our donor base is is global. It's worldwide, and we do conferences all over the world. And sometimes being closer to the East Coast is is really a boon. I mean, it helps with um, like time change, time zones being able to have calls with people and connect with other people. Um, we have a branch, not really a branch, it's a sister organization in the UK called Sense Foundation Europe. Um, and so working with their board, it's much easier to do from Eastern Standard Time than it is from Pacific. Um, mm-hmm. And just having people in Europe are much more likely to fly into New York than they are to fly into California. Um, so that helps too, being a bit more yeah. of a global community. Yeah, if you need someone from Wisconsin, I have some friends at, at the university, so I can, I, I can get you the hookup if that gets you the benefits. But um, what, uh, how do you go about finding these things? So if there's a biotech company out there, maybe someone who's applying for a grant with you, but it's in the Midwest, how would they go to find these uh, opportunities so they can build in the Midwest while also, you know, like working with you guys at the same time? Like how do they go to find the, the grants that the states offer? I've never done this. I, I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm not the one researching it. My, my director of oh, operations okay. is. Um, I just know that it's possible. You have to contact them. I'm not really, a lot mm. of them, I know New York state had um, a whole program online through their state that was about biotech innovation, but I'm not the one doing the research. So on, on that right now. So I don't really know. It's That's all good. a terrible answer. Uh, no, I, I, I prefer it when people just say, I don't know, versus like spend four and a half minutes <laughs> kind of answering. And it's like, uh, so then I have to figure out like, do they not want to answer or they or they can't answer, you know? Yay, the, the cat's coming into the frame. The, uh, oh, I've already kicked her uh, out. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I, I already told her, like, if she wants to keep the cat in there, like I'm sure everyone will, you know, I'll see a spike in retention with the cat there. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, and, uh, also with the end of aging disease conference, you spoke... You spoke about uh, uh, the, the, so there's basically seven strains that you're working on, like seven different avenues uh, at Sens, and you have three ish experts that are focusing on them. So you're missing uh, the other four. Um, where, what, what, what are those four that you're looking for? Or maybe someone listening could be like, "Oh, I know someone who can help you with that." So it's it's a little more complicated than that. Um, okay. We do have officially three team leads who are working on replenisens, apoptosens, and mitosens. However, um, we our apoptosens gentlemen and our replenisens gentlemen are both doing a little bit of lysosens work. So really, we have those covered. Um, but we and we do have other of our strands covered externally, not all of them. Um, so we do have some experts externally that are working on it at other institutions, like our glycosense program is being run by a gentleman right now, not really run, but he's doing a project <laughs> um, in, in glycosense at Babraham Institution in the UK, for instance. Um, but in-house, we need a glycosense program that is about dealing with crosslinks, <laughs> dealing with crosslinks between tissues. Um, we have, we need, oh, I'm going to... I know we don't have an Oncosense program right now. That's um, cancer research. We used to have mm-hmm. one in-house for a while. It didn't really take off. We were looking at ALT, which is alternative lengthening of telomeres, which is different than using telomerase to extend telomeres. Um, telomeres are the end caps, like the aglets of your shoelace on your DNA, um, that when they fray and get used up, your DNA starts to fray and unravel. So you want to extend those tel- telomeres, but you don't want to do it too heavily because that is what cancer is, is, is yeah. has an overactive telomerase and they never die, which is a problem. But we had um, a program in-house. But we don't have that anymore. We're actually looking at how we can get another cancer program going, but it's hard because one, cancer research is really well-funded. And so we don't really know if it's worth our while to study it unless we have a new angle. Um, and we don't really have one yet. We're working on it, but I would love to have uh, somebody in-house who has some 
alternative damage repair ideas on cancer and would be lo- and would like to work with us. Really interested in that. Um, like I said, our glycosense program, we're actually going to be putting out an RFP soon, um, a request for proposals. We hit a end. I'm totally off topic. I'm so sorry. We have an end of year campaign um, this past year where we talked about our seven strands and we let people vote when they donated on what program they wanted to see us support more in-house. And glycosense won. So um, we're putting out a request for proposals for that. So I'm actually kind of hoping that we... Um, have some really good responses to that. And we're able to bring somebody in house to run that program. That'd be great. Um, and I know actually I'm missing. To, to oh, inter- uh, I actually have all the seven written down, but uh, if you're forgetting, any, I can, like, check them off. <laughs> Amylosense is the one I'm missing. There we go. We don't have somebody in Amylosense yeah. yet. Yeah. The, uh, actually, to speak of Glycosense, one of our listeners, his name's Lunchbox, or their name, I actually should not assume gender, Lunchbox, <laughs> which is a great name. The, uh, and uh, they have a question. Uh, and it involves glycosense. In 2022, end of year fundraising voted to uh, for the glycosense project. Um, they just want to. Uh, they were curious about the timeline for the funding project. Is it is it still like looking for a person to lead it? You know that type of thing. Like where where is it? It's only been like six, like a couple months. So I imagine it's in the early stages. Yeah, we just we just announced it in January. The winner, so early January. So it hasn't yeah. even. It's been about two months. So we are almost done creating the RFP. So we have to like create a call for the proposal. So that's almost done. Mm. Um, okay. Kind of detailing what we're looking for in that space. And then we're going to be posting it on our website. I would say probably by, I would hope that we would post it by end of this month, but I'm hoping it might be another month out. I'm not sure. I have to talk to my my VP of research, um, Dr. Robbie Jane, but he's the one developing it with um, Michael Ray, who's one of our science writers who's been with us forever. Um, they're, they're creating the RFP. I'm hoping it'll be up by end of this month, post it online. And then we take applications. We'll be taking applications. There's an application deadline, I believe. We've set it up for September, September 1, maybe, September 1st, um, to give people time because the RFP proposals that we get usually have to be kind of extensive. And we'll review them as we get them. We're not going to wait until September to start reviewing. Um, And when we get them in-house, reviewing them, if we find any good applicants, we'll reach out to them and we usually bring them in-house to interview. So we'll have a phone interview for it. It's kind of like a job interview. We'll interview with them first. We'll have them come in and present their research to our top scientists in-house to see if their science is um, is something we do, is damage repair, is, um, and is also feasible. We have some really great scientific minds on staff, and if it's something that they think is not actually feasible to accomplish, then we probably won't fund it. Um, there's a couple of projects we've, we've had like that that we've kind of shelved for the time being because the technology isn't there yet to support the research, and we want to really support things that have a way to impact people now and not 20 years from now when the tech is better. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll do that. We'll bring them in house. We're hoping to start the project no later than January 1st of next year, because oftentimes these people are either in other institutions that we have to negotiate contracts with, or we bring them in house, which actually moves a lot faster if we can do it that way. Um, but it depends on the person and the applicant and what they're bringing to us and what their situation is and whether or not we fund it externally or internally. Um, I'm really hoping for an internal person. But yeah, so application deadline, I believe, is September 1st. Please don't quote me on this. It'll be out. It'll all post online. We'll make a big announcement of it on our social media when it all goes up. And then um, we should start no later than January 1 of next year for the project. Assuming we get good applicants. Our last RFP that we put out was maybe four years ago for a fellowship that was funded by the Forever Healthy Foundation. Um. And that took a, a while to fill. We didn't get very many good applicants, but it wasn't nearly as detailed as this RFP is. Um, or specific, like, we were kind of accepting anything that was damage repair. And we got a lot of not great proposals. But the guy that we had, that we finally accepted, um, Dr. Tesfahun Admasu, was from Ethiopia. He was amazing. He is amazing. He's with us still. He's still running our projects. And he's on the board of the TAFD, which is the new South African... Um, longevity organization that started up I um, mean, he's on their board now and he's still worth working with us and he's fantastic can't say enough good things about him so I'm really hoping that we get lucky again with this RFP where we have somebody coming in-house that will really add to our scientific base yeah uh, yeah the uh there you go lunchbox but uh the um what um for the different strains on average if you look at it from the beginning to the end 
of the research like how much does it cost to actually fulfill a research idea like this like if it's um mitosense etc like what is the general cost if it is possible to generalize on it's, like what does it cost really, to like do it it's really hard um to get you mean to get something like into a company or onto the market is what you're talking about right or to complete a scientific I'm, th I'm thinking more endeavor. yeah from from like just proposal to they've proven it out and a company can buy the IP or they can spin it out to make a, an IP a, a company at that point. Okay, so that is really difficult to ascertain. I mean, we've I mean, I would say at least a million dollars um, as a minimum. I don't think we have had any research project that has cost less than a million dollars over the course of a minimum of three years. Um, yeah. To do, especially if you're doing a spin out, um, we but we do also have research projects that are more basic research, like our Mitosense program, which um, has been going since we were founded, essentially. Oh no, they weren't our first. Lysosense was our first. Um, so maybe since 2011, about 2011, we've had a Mitosense program. I want to say, and they have been working on creating copies of the mitochondrial genome in the nucleus. Um, and they've been doing a really good job of it, actually creating those. Um, oh, there's a word for it that I'm totally blanking. I'm going to say autologous, but I'm not sure that's correct. Um, so again, don't quote me on it. But they've been doing this since about 2011. And they cost our, I mean, they we probably spent $5 million minimum on that program. And it's not ready to be spun out into anything just yet. Um, and I'm not sure it ever will. Um but the research that they are creating, frankly, is invaluable. Um, it's, it's more basic research. It's not going to be an injectable or a drug that you can take that will cure you um, of any mitochondrial disorders or mutations you have, at least not yet. We're not there yet. The technology isn't there yet for that. Um, but the work they're doing is really, really important and is going to be able to help a lot of people in the long term. You're looking at mitochondrial disorders, especially those of like the orphan diseases that affect I know, I know we're an aging organization, but there's a specific orphan disease of mitochondrial dysfunction where they're missing an entire complex from of mitochondrial, like a mitochondrial complex that allows their mitochondria to work. And with the technology that's created now where you can kind of alter the genome of embryos before they're implanted, um, that could like save children's lives. And I know children isn't really our focus, but um, it's kind of a side effect of the work that we're doing in Mitosense. Um, there's some other work yeah. going on there um, at, at medicines, I think is really important, but that might eventually be translational, translational in the near term. So I can't talk about it because um, mm -hmm. it's confidential, but there is, but there is some stuff, but that one specific program of medicine has been going on for over 10 years and we've spent so much money on it, but it's so important that we don't mind doing it. And we also don't mind doing it because it's not being funded elsewhere because it is very basic research. It doesn't have a lot of like, okay, we're going to get a drug on the market next year or in five years even. Um, but it needs to be done. We, we need to know these things sometimes to get that technology forward, to get those therapies on the market. And that's what we've been working on. And I love our Mitosense program. I think um, the woman who heads it is Dr. Mutha Bumanathan, and she is fantastic at what she does. Um, she's one of the top experts now in mitochondria in the world. Hmm. Yeah, I have a, a couple of writing questions on Mitosense. Like even the audience loves uh, Mitosense the most. There's like a, one on uh, Glycosense, but most people are like, get her, get her to talk about Mitosense. So like, I think the, 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 the feeling is mutual in terms of your audience, like literal people who are uh, sense donors are like, Hey, you know, but anyways, um, the, when, you, when the funding is done, let's say, you know, sense is, uh, Mitosense is done or any of these projects are done. Do, does uh, sense become like a, a like an uh, IP transfer office in terms of like licensing out to other people to develop or what happens to the base research at that point? Okay, so for internal research projects, projects that we are entirely own because it started in SRF facilities and we've maintained it until it's ready to spin out. Um, that's happened now three times, four times, three times, I think internally. So one went to i -Corp. One of our Lysosense programs went to i Therapeutics. They thought that they could take that technology further. So we, yes, licensed it to them, essentially, um, with a very small stake in the outcome. So we have a little bit of, a, of an ownership of that company, but not much. Um, another one is Cyclarity. It used to be Underdog. Now it's Cyclarity. They're doing mm -hmm. Lysosense work as well. But instead of doing um, the one at i is uh, LysoClear, it's working on macular degeneration. 
The one at Cyclarity is working on atherosclerosis. It's a small molecule drug to treat atherosclerosis um, through a lysosense style damage repair. Um, that is run by our old CEO and our old vice president of research, um, Mike Cope and Dr. Oki O'Connor. And we own a stake in it. We're going to get paid back eventually. So basically what we do is where you didn't really, I mean, we kind of licensed it out because we own it. So we did license it, but by and large, um, when we do these sorts of things, we, we do spin outs. We try to take a small stake in the company because biggest thing for us at SRF is that that technology takes off and that it gets someplace where it can be useful to people. If, if we were to take a big, I know a lot of other companies will take a larger stake in the company, um, a large ownership proportion of that company. We don't do that. We take a very small ownership proportion. We usually take a small royalty stake. We have a small licensing fee where we give an exclusive license to the company. Um, and then sometimes we, we take, we ask for payment back. So we spent over a million dollars on the, on Cyclarity's program on that's tech. And once they reach a certain funding level, they are required to pay that back to us in installments Sounds. annually. So that our goal at that point, they should be stable enough that they can afford to do that. And it's not going to impact their, um, their clinic work, which is really what we don't want to happen. And we also take a board seat. It's an, it's an observer seat on the boards that we spin out. Um, and it's not so that we have voting rights or anything. It's so that we get to really understand and have a little bit of input into what that company is doing. Because mm -hmm. we, you know, a lot of people talk about like, well, when we make these therapies, are they for the rich only? And we're very adamantly, no, this is not going to be just for the rich. It's going to be for everybody. But when we spin something out, because we don't really, I mean, we still own it, but we don't own it entirely anymore, right? We're giving it to this other company to do with what they can. Um, we need to be able to make sure that they're not selling out, that they're not making these drugs so inaccessible that not everybody's able to get it. And one of the things I love about Cyclarity specifically is that one of their major funders is um, Kaizu, which is the investment arm of Forever Healthy Foundation, essentially, who has been a donor to us and has helped us with some of our investments in the past. Um, they are really, really um, invested in making that a $10 pill to, to cure atherosclerosis. And that's really what they're doing. They're talking about is curing atherosclerosis with this technology that we developed in-house at SRF. Um, and one of the main reasons that Oki and Mike left to do that is to make sure that one, it's a great technology, but is to make sure that that actually happens, that it stays accessible, that they don't sell out to some pharma that's going to bury it or charge enormous sums of money for it. They want this to be a technology that's accessible to everybody. So that's, that's something we're really invested in at SRF too, is making sure that one, we don't handicap these companies when we license them our tech. Um, and two, we still have an observer seat on their board to be able to kind of nudge them to maintain an appropriate trajectory to clinic and afterwards. Um, there was one other one that we did. Um, oh, our previous um, our previous Oncosense program, we translated into a company, but that didn't we didn't make that didn't go anywhere, unfortunately. Yeah. Valley of death. Yeah, no, uh, <clears throat> I like that approach because I, there are other nonprofits I've had on the show or that I've talked to and they just, they spend all the money on the R&D to build out the, the base that other people can build off of, but they don't have any licensing component or anything like this. And it's, to me, even taking all the benefits of just making sure it's going in the right direction away, how does the organi organization keep funding itself to build more foundational level research and have more impact on the industry if it's just basically giving their hard work away for free? Like I understand like nonprofit, like that's to some extent the objective, but if there is some type of like feedback cycle, you can do even more. Like it kind of like, it's like, uh, uh, it's, yeah. uh, not nonlinear, like it's a great, uh, return. I, I actually, I, some of my friends who run uh, nonprofits, I make fun of them like, you know, maybe like have a little bit and then, you know, you can, even a city, even towns, when you when a new business moves in, they'll do like ten percent tax, twenty percent tax, thirty percent tax. Like they like they cut down the tax so that over ten years, by the tenth year, they start paying full tax for that region to make it easier for people to move in. So it's the same type of concept. Like you can build out the industry while also making sure the thing that's building out the industry is maintained throughout it. We usually take like a two or three percent stake in the company, usually. Yeah. And so it's it's minimal, but it's there. Um, the other thing is for external research that we do, where we fund research at other institutions, we often negotiate with the institution that when they license the technology, we get a proportion of the university's stake in that company based on how much we funded. So the institutions don't really like that. 
<laughs> but um, we've negotiated that successfully with a number of institutions at this point where we had to put in an interinstitutional agreement to make sure that we get a little bit of a kickback. Um, and then we also, because we have such a good relationship with these people who are starting these companies, we know the people who are running them, the scientists are usually involved and we um, keep in touch with our scientists, even our external ones pretty heavily, um, that we develop a good relationship and oftentimes we'll make additional investments in those companies um, to help them get going. Not yeah. always, but usually. And that well, that also helps. Why did the research university... Uh the universities dislike it if you're funding it why wouldn't you want a percentage of it um i mean we do want a percentage but they don't want to give it yeah i mean they're yeah well they just, yeah because they're big institutions who don't like doing that i mean literally mm. i th think the first time we did it was with yale the first time we negotiated that successfully and to the best of my knowledge the guy who actually agreed to it got fired um wow because it wasn't something that they had ever done and they, when we were negotiating it, they were talking about that with us. Like, well, we've never done this before. And I'm like, I understand, but we're a nonprofit too. You're working with a nonprofit. You're not working with a for-profit institution. And we should get some consideration considering our funding. And their stance is, well, it's our employee doing the work. So we have full ownership. Um, and to a certain extent, them. yes, but right. But we pay them. And oftentimes in large sums, I mean, some of our programs at Einstein or Yale or Cambridge or Oxford have been expensive, um, you know, but we also we also negotiate with them, which they also don't like. I mean, if you look at most institutions in direct rates, you know, their F&A rates, their facility and administration, their overhead, um, some mm -hmm. of their rates are like 90 yeah. percent. Like it's it's insane. Our F&A rate is 20 percent or less. We, I try to keep it at around 18 but usually sometimes we hit 20 and, and we don't pay indirects. It's when people submit grants to us, usually you have to pay a certain amount of overhead to the institution externally. Um, we don't do that. Um, and I just got into it with Stanford not too long ago, actually, because they were really mad that we were giving them money and we were refusing to pay overhead. And they're like, well, you can't do it this way. And I'm like, I'm telling you that this is how we do it. And it has worked this way with every other institution. This is how it's going to work with yours. And we eventually got that where we weren't paying overhead anymore. Um, and that's been our standard policy going forward because we're interested in funding research. We're not interested in paying. I mean, let me put it this way. I understand as I own a, a nonprofit, essentially, I run it, that there is a lot of back end that goes into working these grants to, to making the research go. We have a robust administrative and department um, an outreach department that don't get restricted money, right? We we don't get grants for that for like our accountants, right? They don't get they don't get restricted money, and so our overhead covers their fees, which I which I appreciate when we're giving out grants. But also, we're such a small nonprofit that we don't have the extra money to support your admin your admin staff, especially when you're charging eighty or ninety percent indirect off your government grants that you're getting. Government can afford to pay that. We can't. So yeah. we're making sure that the money that we give out goes directly to the research and the researchers and does not cover indirect rates. And that's been a policy for us for most of our, our existence and something that I enforce vigorously because I want to make sure that we're supporting the research as much as, as, much as we can and as directly yeah. as we can. No, it sounds really smart. The, I wish more people would do that because at I think it's kind of silly that you fund the thing and they think they should just get full run or, you know, they can, there's so many, um, I think the blue, the pink ribbon for breast cancer for the NFL, only 1% actually goes to breast cancer research. It's like less Like that's, that's like, what's the point? Like why does 99% of people get to take a piece of that? You know, like what's the purpose of it? It, it really bothers I, me. I look at people's indirect. So I understand again, as a nonprofit that you have to, you have to cover your expenses. Like we couldn't do most of what we do without our administrative department. We just, we just couldn't, or without our outreach department, they are essential to our operations. I get that. But also there is no way that I'm an organization, um, any money, if 90% of it is going. So whenever I donate, I do a little bit like personally of charity here and there, we donate to good causes. My brother especially does so. And we, um, he'll ping me and say, Hey, can you look into this organization for me? And I'll look at their tax returns and I'll look and see what their FNA rates are and what they're spending on the actual program that they're, they're pontificating about and see if it's legitimate. And if, if that most of your money is going there, I mean, I'm okay with 
25, even 30% of, of it to support back end. But if the majority of my money isn't going to program, you're not getting it. It's just, it's just not like from a personal standpoint. And so I always encourage my family to like, please just look into the organizations that you're trying to raise money for, or you're trying to donate to, but because it matters. Cause you're right. That, that sort of thing is like Susan B. Combs is just too much money goes into the back end, And if your back end is that, um, needs that much support, then I think you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I can't, I, I would love for someone to like, just like take a, like take like a stethoscope or something and start like investigating, like why it has to be 99%, like, like really justify it, you know? Um, it's cool that you can go through and break it down. That's one of the things I liked about Sense is that when I'm doing my, when I did my background on understanding you or, or research in Sense for when I uh, interviewed Oki like five years ago, um, the there's a lot of data out there. Like you guys have a, a, like pretty much like a yearly report that says like, hey, here's the research, here's what's cap. It's like, it's like it's like its own little journal publication that has, hey, here's and also like the little Legos, like it's it's very well done, uh, showing like, hey, here, here are our costs, here's our stuff, here's our, our vision for the future. Um, and that type of thing. The uh, I don't think the tax return was up there, but I'm sure it was fine, findable. I'm not uh, too accounting, but I'm sure there's a way to find it too. We we have we post them publicly on our website. Okay. Um, although they are delayed, so we won't do our taxes for 2022 until September of this year. So, mm. so they it is it t- you have to wait a little bit to get the. There's never really a current version; it's always a year behind. But that goes up there, yeah. and then in our annual report, we also post our expenses and our income and a breakdown of what those went towards. And every year we are dead set on our research being more than 50% of our budget. And that's, that's not admit We don't, we don't charge our research in direct rates internally. So when you're seeing a mito budget of $500,000 for the year, that's research and research personnel that has none of my salary, none of our admin salaries, right? That's just their project. Um, and then you'll see an admin category separately that, that breaks down the admin costs, but by and large, those are direct costs that you're seeing. And so we're very, very careful that the vast majority of our funding goes to program. And so like research is always more than 50%. Education is usually up there as well. And then outreach and admin. Yeah. How do you, uh, is there any insights into how you negotiate it with the universities? Like I think one aspect could be like, people just don't even know they can do that. And then the other aspect is if they're told no immediately, people are like, okay, I'm going to go about my day now. Other than just having the fortitude to keep asking, like, is there is there insights that you can share on how to get that done in that way? Yeah, knowing what you're doing helps. I mean, I am mm. uh, Mike Cope, our previous CEO, is um, was a lawyer who did tech work, IP work. So he trained me. I am not a lawyer by training, but he trained me and would I would he and I together would negotiate with the institutions and we'd look at we would look at the contracts very closely together. And so I learned how to negotiate that and what is expected. But the main thing is is recognizing that. You can ask for anything and they can and and see where you get. And so the 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 real answer is to start with really what you want to see and be on and understand where you're willing to go and then just stick it there. Like just stay there. And I think it also weirdly helps that we're small and relatively unknown to these larger institutions, or at least we were, because I think, especially when I was negotiating with Yale for the IIA that we did for the the portion of their work that we paid for. Um I don't think they expected anything to come of that work. And so they were like, fine. And then when something came of it, they were like, oh, well, now we have to negotiate this and follow the terms of our agreement. And, and you also have to be sure that when you get those terms in there, you enforce them. Because a lot of yeah. times, if you don't enforce them, they're not going to adhere to them. Like you have to like be forceful about what you're due for your contract. But um Sometimes it's just finding the right people. It's it's going up the ladder enough so that you get the right people who can approve that stuff. Um, and being friendly helps. Like not seeming like you're a jerk really helps. Um, people, if they if they think that you're you're really just working out for the best of your organization and you're being nice and polite about it, they're willing to help you more. Um, there's some people who go into negotiations with like a really like stiff back about it. Yeah. Um, and a stern look. And I'm I'm not particularly stern most of the time. And I just, I, I try to be polite and kind and work with what they're willing to give us and then push a little bit more. And because if I've been kind and polite and given them some things that they want, they're willing to give me more of what I want. Um, so, you know, honey collects more flies than vinegar sort of thing. Um, yeah. 
But I think a lot of it too is just finding the right people to talk to. Um, these institutions sometimes are huge. And if you're talking to the wrong person for so long, they're not going to give you anything either because they can't or because they'll make promises that they can't uphold. Um, the other thing I would recommend is getting things in writing. If somebody, yeah. even a low level person promises you something in writing, they're going to have to adhere to it much, much more likely than if it was just over the phone. Um, I'm actually not a phone person much anyway. I prefer email. Um, yeah. So keeping things written as much as possible really helps. Oh, but you, the, your person said this and they're representative of your organization. So this is acceptable, right? And they, and it's really hard for someone to be like, no, they're uninformed, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, that has happened where people have said, no, they were uninformed or they couldn't make that decision. But by and large, they're like, crap, they put it in writing. They agreed to this. I guess we have to do it, um, which is great. But it's fun because in my position, when you're, when you have some power over the organization, you also recognize from the other side of it that you can say that. You can't say, no, this person didn't have the ability to promise that and I'm sorry. I've had to say that, unfortunately, a lot where somebody has promised something on behalf of our organization, but they didn't have the ability to do so. And then somebody contacts me and says, hey, this person said I could do this or you would give me this. Where is it? And I go, I'm so sorry. And then I have to like, all my apologies and try to make it up as best as I can. But like, I'm not going to give someone $500,000 because somebody who didn't have the authority to promise it hmm. said that they could have it. And I think that's part of it as well from the opposite side is recognizing that you can say those things, even if you don't really want to, or even if you think it might make your organization look bad. And I think at least as a small organization, we have a lot more to lose because we don't have as many resources. And so we have to be a little more firm about not about what we do with our resources and how we give them out and what we accept in return. So I've, I've learned how to be a little bit, I've learned how to be firm, but polite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, I think especially if you're building a long, a potentially a long-term relationship with an organization, I think that's a very smart way to go about it. I know a guy or girl who uh, used to negotiate and it was like, you shake that guy's hand and you have to like count your fingers when you're done. Like he, 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 will, he will argue the most ag aggressive it was like there was like no soul behind his eyes and he would just keep he would keep negotiating keep negotiating it's like he would keep going beyond what he thought was appropriate like he because he would he would talk after it's like why did you keep going i thought we only wanted like five or whatever and he was like i, I sense i could get more it's like well how do you know like we have to work with them eventually you know again you know they're not going to want to work with you if you keep doing this like you can get away with, i think you can be get away with it like one time so i guess if you're like an evil person you can get away with it one time but that like that spreads and then people don't want to work with you so i think the nice like one of the added benefits about doing it the way that you're proposing or, or that you're illustrating through your, your actions is that um, people want to work with you more. And um, like I think sometimes people feel like if I'm kind, if I'm polite, whatever, people can run me over. It's like, I don't know, uh, at a certain level, maybe. But if you're just like people try to do that to me all the time and uh, I just don't allow it. And it they stop immediately. Like as soon as they'll be like, I'm going to do this thing. It's like, no, you're not. And then they, they immediately stop. Like very rarely does someone like, I'm going to fight you on this. Like, good luck. We're talking via email. Like I can ignore you. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can say no with a smile. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. I, um, it's, it's interesting to have to teach. So there's a lot of people on my staff who are, who are new managers. And so we talk about that a lot about how to be kind and empathetic and, and flexible even for people when, when you need to be but also to understand your boundaries and to set those boundaries and to not push them. Like that's, those are your boundaries and people aren't allowed to cross them and, and know where those are so that you can uphold them. And I think especially in a small, a small institution, that's, that's really, really relevant. And um, you're right. We work with these people. We work with these institutions over and over again. A lot of our researchers come from the same institutions and you develop good working relationships with the admins and with the people in power. And it's, it's so much easier. It makes things easier. And then, but once you have the contract negotiated once, it holds. So you can just go back and say, no, nah, this is the, the contract I'm sticking with, yeah. which is great. I think it sounds like that uh, getting things in writing might also help suss out who the stakeholder people are. Because if I'm a low level person who just wants to feel big, and you're like, oh, I'm going to get this in writing and you have to sign it. Like, well, I'm going to go check with the person. And then you immediately know who's the person who makes decisions because they have to check and get there. So that's kind of like a, a little smart way to like suss out like is this person even 
uh the right person you know because uh ben franklin yeah. was known for being like tricked to go to the the, the england to england and uh because someone was like oh you go there i'm gonna support you and then he got there and they're like oh i'm not gonna do that i just like speaking very big <laughs> people like to feel big big about themselves i guess i don't know but it sounds like a very good way to like suss out you know who actually makes the but decisions if you push enough you quickly find yourself on a zoom call with somebody who's way up the chain that you didn't know about like if you if you're like well that sounds interesting but i think we need to go this direction and, and that person recognizes that they really can't make that decision suddenly it's not an email you're getting from somebody up and up you're on a Zoom call with somebody who's like the dean of the college or something. And you're like, all right, now I'm at the right person. Let's have this conversation. Yeah. But um, I think it's funny. It's also important, I think, to get for us when we're negotiating research grants, it's important to get the scientists behind us because the scientists often bring in a lot of money through government grants for their organization. And they actually have more pool than you would expect them to have in an, in an administration. And also, if you get the administrators behind you, the legal departments of these institutions are just pit bulls. So if you get the admin and, and the researchers behind you and supporting you, then when you go to have to deal with their legal departments, they're much better. They're, they're, they're not quite as rough to deal with. But it's funny, we're like I said, we're trying to develop a relationship right now with the University of Toledo, which I'm really excited about. Um, and they, the administrators are 110% behind us. The researchers are 110% behind us. Um, they want really want to make this work. And, um, and they keep warning me about their legal department. And I'm like, <laughs> it'll be okay. It'll be okay. I promise. It'll be fine. And they're like, no, really, you need to like, they're kind of rough and we really want you to succeed. I'm like, if you want us to su- succeed, we want to succeed. I'm sure we'll reach a mutual understanding. Like, it'll be okay. But I find myself like, almost like consoling or comforting the administrators and the researchers at UT being like, it'll be okay. I, I'm not scared of your legal department. It'll be okay. Mm-hmm. But um, it's nice to have their support. Do they, do you think they like message the legal team? Like, Hey, be, be, be nice to Lisa. Like, you know, it's approved. Oh, I'm sure they do. I don't know how yeah. much the legal team actually listens to them about it, but yeah, I'm sure they, they're putting in good words for us. Yeah. The, um, so, uh, Going going back to Mitosens, um, because there is a listener question and I have some questions about uh mitochondria. But um so I think we may have addressed some of this, so it's fine if we have to skip it. The uh please ask her. This is from New Book E? New Book E? People have the weirdest names on, on the internet. Uh the day that like you have you your actual identity attached to it, like something in China, it's gonna be a weird, weird place. But um please ask her about their it's so polite. Please ask her about their progress in their new newer project to have longer lasting mitochondrial transfusion, as well as any progress they have had recently with allotopic expression of mitochondrial DNA. Is the latter still looking doable, especially with the help of recent protein folding prediction breakthroughs? Is this, is that like a good question? That, that's the I word, that's the word I was looking for the allotopic expression. Um, our allotopic oh, okay. expression program has been going on since 2011 and I knew it was something close like that. I just couldn't remember the word. Um, thank you. Um, it's going really, really well. We're it, program started off kind of slow back in 2011. It's taken it took us a while to to get one complex allotopically expressed in the nucleus from the mitochondrial um, center, but we did it. And since then, we've been making really great progress. Um, we just had a paper published about that I think last year. Um, but there is another one, another project of Mitosens, and I that was started not too long ago. And I probably should look it up because um, I don't really remember. <laughs> um, but it's, they they have some really interesting work and that's the work that is looking to be um, translated. Oh, so stuff. yeah, so it, it's a mitosense program and I know it's, it's not the allotopic expression and I'm not sure it's even listed. Is it not even listed on our website? It might not even be listed on our website. It's, um, it's not, I don't think it's even on there. Um, yeah, so the organelle transplantation is interesting. That's going well as well. But there's one program that we have internally that I can't really even talk about because we're looking at translating it in the next year or two into a company. Um, and our vice president of research, Ravi Jane, is really driving that forward. Ravi has a lot of experience in translating research into companies, which is one of the reasons we hired him. Um, and he's working with Dr. Bumanathan 
to move that project forward. So I can't really even talk about it that much, um, but it's brilliant. And our MitoSense program is probably one of my favorite programs internally. Don't tell my other team leads if they watch this. Um, but Amutha, Dr. Bhuminathan is fantastic. She really knows her stuff and her team has been growing over time. Um, she just got a couple new people in house in the last couple months, actually. Um, and I'm really excited to see what they do. They were doing a another program called Gene Drive, which we actually had to shelve. I talked a little bit about having to shelve projects that don't have the, the technology available right now to make an impact. We had to shelve the Gene Drive because it had to do with um, genetic targeting. Um, and we're just not there yet. I, I was actually just talking to my kids about this. Um, there was a kid in their classroom who died recently of a genetic disorder. And they were like, well, why couldn't we fix that? And I, and I had to say, well, every cell in your body has genes. And if you're talking about genetic disorder, every single one of those genes has this problem and you have to fix them all. Otherwise you don't fix the disorder, right? You still have the pathology, even if you fix one cell and you can do it when you're talking about embryos, because there's not that many cells, right? Um, when you're, when you're first making them, but you can't really do that kind of genetic modification in person like a legitimate person that's has trillions of cells. So um, the gene drive project was interesting about basically doing that, looking at, at creating a solution to these mitochondrial disorders on a person wide system, but we don't really have the tech for that yet. And we're not the company to make that tech, frankly. I mean, we have some really great ideas on when that tech is available on how to make that relevant to mitochondrial disorders and how to make that relevant to mitochondrial aging. But we don't we don't have that tech yet. So we've actually solved that project recently, even though it, it showed a little bit of promise because we're, we're talking five, 10, 20 years down the road before that tech is available. And we don't want to spend our money and time doing that when we have other avenues to explore that have more translatability into people now. Um, and so there is one doing that with the medicines program. I'm really excited about it. I can't talk about it. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But it's going really well. And the allotopic expression is, is fantastic. We're we're hoping to um, make even more progress on that in the next year or two and have another paper published. Um, again, but that's not something that you can really translate right now. Um, but mm -hmm. that I think that basic research is extremely important. And we were one of the first institutions in the world to showcase that we can actually do allotopic expression. So yay for our mitosense team. <laughs> For the gene drive, was the issue the number of cells that you could edit at one time to affect the genetic expression of the illness, or what was the limiting factor? Yeah, basically, you you would have mm -hmm. to target every every single cell in the body to make an impact, more or less. And I mean, when you get you can get into stem cells and talk and talk about genetically modifying your stem cells, which would eventually proliferate over your body. But then that's even harder too. There's, I mean, the tech is just isn't available right now. Mm -hmm. um, when it is, we'll start that program up again. And we are keeping an eye on that sort of thing to see. We try to keep uh, close tabs on what the technology is available biomedically so that we can see what we're actually capable of doing. We have a number of projects in our Apoptosense program too that right now are not translatable. Um, they have some good promise, but the technology isn't there yet that we've also shelved. Um, and, and by say shelved, I say shelved as opposed to trashed, right? Because it, it's good research, it's good data. It has promise where it's just not we're just not there. So we're putting it on our shelf for a later date. Um, yeah. yeah. I recently had George Church on and we were talking about editing millions of cells at the same time with multiplexing. And he was like, it's possible. Uh, but it is hard. Um, this is kind of like more of like a me question uh, in terms of something I wonder about. Uh, what do you think powered the cells before mitochondria was absorbed into them? Do we know? Um, I don't know. Uh, before, the, I mean, yeah. my guess is, is that, I mean, we really weren't, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Let me just start there. Um, so my guess is, is that we were not really complex like that. I don't think we were probably multicellular organi organ organisms until we were able to absorb mitochondria. Um, mm. Because so I mean, you can look one. at, you can look at like, um, you can look at other organisms that use like, you know, their, um, wow, the chloroplasts to, to create energy and things of that sort. And I think that's legitimate. And I'm, I think 
but I think the absorption of the mitochondria is really what allowed us to proliferate as multicellular organisms. But again, not an evolutionary biologist. Yeah. Any don't, evolutionary don't biologists who, who know more, you know, write in and then you can answer it for both of us. The, uh, so we've, just talk, we've talked about glycosans, we've talked about mitosans, and I love the naming schemes. It, may, it lets everyone know exactly who, who's supporting these things. Um, so we have senostem, lysosan, adoptosans, uh, as other ones that I don't think we've, we've covered. How are, how are they going? So senostem is not, it's not a brand. Senostem is... It was on your uh, report thing. Yeah, that's a project. Okay. Senostem is a project. It's not. It's not a. It's not a branch. Oh, it's not its own um, thing. Okay. Yeah, Senostem was under replenescence, and that's eh, going okay. Um, <laughs> it's hard. Stem cells are hard. Replenescence is mostly about stem cells, and stem cells are hard. Mm. Um, our apoptosens program uh, is going really well. We we have a lot of pro- sub projects right there. Um, right now we have a project being funded about um, NK cells, car NK cells. Um, with Vita Dow, which is like this. Do you know who Vita Dow is? It's like a crypto d- democratic funding source, basically. Oh, those things, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was so the name of really... a person. Like, do you know Vita Dow? <laughs> like the Italian. <laughs> no. So Vita, Vita Dow is this organization that um, funded one of our Poptosense programs. And with the idea of they're going to be funding it for a couple of years, we're going to reach some milestones, and then they're going to take it to turn it into a company. And they have a whole system set up for this. Um, to be. So I'm really excited to see how that goes. Um, it's our first real endeavor in this way. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little off topic, but I'm excited about it because we often have a problem where we have brilliant scientists in house that are making really great work. And then we need to really make these, these, these technologies translatable into a company and get them on the market and get them through all these stages of clinic. And it's, our scientists don't largely, largely don't want to do that. They don't want to be in the industry. They don't want to be in the commercial sector. They want to be doing the research that they're doing in the laboratories. And I'm kind of grateful for that because I don't want to lose their expertise in-house, um, especially when they're still doing really great work. And so Vita Dow gave us this opportunity really to, one, give us a grant to fund some of our work, but two, also have a platform really to create kind of that company that will take on our our, our technology. And so it's already kind of prepped and ready to go. Um, and they've been talking to us a lot about um, taking more of that tech of our, of our work, funding more of our work and taking more of it and spinning it out. And um, I know we talked a little bit about how we're cautious about where we spin things out to and, and how we take a stake in those companies, because we want to make sure that they're done right and they're t- taken to market correctly. And while Vita Dow has a really great team of people who have a lot of experience, and they do, and I love the people on there. They're really great, really invested in our in our work um, and in longevity space in general. They don't have a track record for doing what they're doing for us right now, really, as right. an organization. And so we've talked a little bit about them taking more of our tech, and I keep telling them, let's wait and see. Let's, let's see how yeah. this goes. So it's going to have to be a long-term relationship because I'm not going to be able to see what they do with it probably for another five or 10 years. But it's something we have written in our contract that they only have so many years to do something with our tech. If they don't do something at that point, the license no longer exists because we want to make sure that we have the ability to make that tech happen elsewhere if they can't do it. But if they do manage to get it you know, through clinic and on market, then we're probably going to be developing much more with them. But I think it's a great pipeline. You need to have that. And we don't really have that in-house yet. We really want to develop that we have some, like, like I said, Dr. Jane, our vice president of research has some really great experience in that realm, but, you know, case in point, Cyclarity, who took our Lysosense work and is running with it, they, to get that to happen, our CEO and our vice president of research left. And if you keep doing that, we're not going to be an organization for much longer. So um, having that sort of pipeline in place is going to be a huge boon, assuming that it works. So I really hope it does. But anyway, so one of our apoptosense programs are, are, are doing that. Um, but we have a lot more apoptosans coming out. We're applying for some R ones, some grants to the government. I don't know if you know this, but we don't have any government funding. We've never had mm. any government funding. We've always been privately funded uh, through grassroots donations, through um, wealthy, high net worth individuals who decided that they are interested in what we do, through a couple foundations here and there, through family foundations, but never through the government. Um, and so that's really our where we're trying to target is try to get more government money in the door. 
because it's a stable source of income. You get it from a multi-year grant. Um, so we have two grants going out this year in ApoptoSense for the work. Um, there's a paper that was just published for ApoptoSense recently, one of their works. Um, so ApoptoSense is doing really great. The gentleman who's running that is Dr. Amit Sharma. He's brilliant. Doing, excuse me, doing really great work in the space. And our Replenisense program is just getting off the ground. Um, Dr. Hadi Reba has been with us for about a year now. Um, and he was working on Sanostem, which was um, kind of the the child of um, Dr. Alexander Stolzing, who was our prior vice president of research. Um, and he's been doing some things with it. We have um, a, currently a PhD student working with us on that project. And there will, there will be a publication on that, but we probably won't take it much past there. Um, I'm not sure Sanostem is ready for translation. I'm not sure it ever will be. So it's a very interesting project, but I don't think it, I don't think it's going to, it's not going to be especially relevant. And actually we have a, we have a bit of a problem with stem cells, honestly, if I'm, if I'm going to be really honest about it and that most of the stem cell work we're doing and people in longevity are doing are in mice. And while that's mm -hmm. interesting, um, and it gives you some basic research information, it's not really translatable. Uh, I used to work for a company called, um, Immune Path with Dr. John Schlondorn and actually Dr. Kelsey Moody, which is where Kelsey and I originally met, um, doing stem cell work in hematopoietic stem cells. And we started in mice and it was just really hard to translate into humans. The The markers aren't the same. Um, what you see in mice happening doesn't always happen in humans. And frankly, I think when we're talking about longevity work, maybe even just about biomedical work, we kind of need to get away from mouse work. I mean, it's interesting, like extending... I think the LEVF or LEV Foundation is doing mouse work right now at i Therapeutics. And it's interesting. They're trying to ex extend mouse lifespans, but how translatable is that? You know, our mission at SRF is really focused around making meaningful impacts in human health span now, like now. And so we, we are focusing our research as much as we can in that area. And I think as a community, as a longevity community, we need to get a little further away from the mouse studies and the focus on extending mouse life and instead focus on human life. Like, cause like again, stem cells are, are great. They're really interesting. There's a lot to do there, but the, the markers and the functions between mice and humans, are, it's not really applicable. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard to make progress if you're talking about real therapies on the market. So I keep getting off topic. No, I, I, I prefer off topic because we're following where your interest lies. But how would you build a better mousetrap in terms of uh, research? Because I agree, we, research in mice often dies there. It doesn't translate to humans all the time. It's, it, it's, it, it's, it's another value, that, one of those value deaths. So is there a better system for testing out these therapies so that they can more one-on-one -on -one translate to humans other than just humans? I mean, well, you, I'm not really sure. I think, hmm. I think we're going to get there with tech. I think eventually you're going to have essentially a brainless human body that you can test things on. I personally, I think that's where we're going. Um, right now you can have in vivo studies that are, that are mimicking human function, but not fantastic, but you are also having people creating organs. Right. And I think when you're, when we successfully create, I mean, you've already had esophaguses, bladders, thymuses. I think we're on the realm for kidneys and liver soon. I think we're heading in that direction. And I think that those kinds of organ donations are, or organ creation rather is going to be great, not only for organ donation and for donors getting that, but um, also for our biomedical research. I think when you're talking about atherosclerosis, you need to look at legitimate arteries and legitimate hearts. And so like looking at heart studies, pigs are a much better model Right. So you can use pigs. I feel bad about using pigs though, because they're so smart. Um, but yeah, you, there's, tasty, there's, though. there's, <laughs> they are. Um, and there's primates that you can use as well for some of these studies that are more, but I also feel like animal testing is, I mean, it's better than mice using the, the higher life forms, but I also feel like it's a little less ethical. And that's just my personal opinion. Um, so I think eventually, though, we're going to get to the place where you're going to have at least partial human bodies recreated that you're going to be testing things in. Um, the other thing, which is going to, I hope, please don't get mad at me, everybody listening, is um, we already have a little bit like a right to try for people who have terminal illnesses. And I think more and more people who are willing to to do that, to, to 
essentially be lab rats for for the scientific community to, to further our biomedical knowledge and really help progress our medical research who don't really have anything to lose at that point will be useful probably sooner than the artificial human bodies used for testing. But that's that feels really morbid. Um, but we already do have right to try laws in place for drugs that haven't passed clinic yet. Um, and I think that helps. But we, I have to say at SRF, we get a lot of people volunteering who, who say, who to best of my knowledge are not terminal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but who are like, if you have any tech that you want to like inject into me, I'll do it. I mean, we get, we get at least one of those a month for the last 14 years. Like, so there are people willing to do that. Um, I don't advocate for that. Um, and just, just an FYI, just for everybody listening, SRF does not do that. We don't, we don't accept, Disclaimer. we don't accept to, yeah, we don't accept that. We don't accept volunteers doing that. We accept volunteers, but, and we will happily take people's blood. Um, cause a lot of our stuff we test in Vampires. blood, we need blood samples, um, which is really interesting, but, but no, we're not going to inject anybody. We don't create pharmaceutical grade anything in house. Anything that is going to reach that stage, we're going to spit out into a company and they're going to go through a proper pathway to do it. We're not going to do that in our, we're not going to do that in our labs. Um, But one of our apoptosense, actually, if you're in the Bay Area and you want to donate blood, um, one of our apoptosense programs is looking for um, a wide variety of age ranges and health ranges for one of their studies. Um, And we have a phlebotomist on site. So email us if you're interested in donating blood. That'd be great. Um. Yeah, we don't accept we don't accept human test subjects. Mm, not yet, or at least that's the official line. But uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> People are gonna be like, uh, you know, they'll know it. we're joking. Um, hopefully, also hope that your plebotomist wears vampire fangs. At least I know whenever I donate blood, they have like you know vampires welcome here or something like that. So, uh, oh, I bet Elena here. could be convinced to do that. Honestly, she's great. Yeah. she could probably do it. Yeah, uh, not in the Midwest when they ever do those drives and stuff. They usually have some vampire related uh, stuff. And if you bring garlic, they don't uh, shrivel. So it's definitely not them who are doing it. Um, so I know we wanted to jump into uh, education. That's a big thing that you're working on. It's a big uh, thing that I care about as well. I mean, it's a learn with all podcast. I love to learn. Um, one program, one thing that I was looking at in particular, that I was really excited for is this post bachelor fellowship program, because um, Many people get their bachelor's degree and it's like, well, I started my job, but I don't really like this. And I'm really like, I spent all my time reading about this stuff. Why can't I like respec, you know, kind of like an RPG game. Why can't I respec and learn fishing? I don't want to be an armorer anymore, <laughs> which maybe is too juvenile of a, of a concept. But um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, education, your your uh, plans to uh, lift up the next generation of people or the current generation of people and get them into um, these fields where they can do the things that they, I think maybe they, they realized uh, that they would more enjoy doing. Yeah, so we have we have two components to our education program right now, maybe three even. So we have our program that brings students who are our post baccalaureate students who are already in the sciences into our laboratories to teach them about aging and how to apply their science to aging. As a bit of an aside about that, I have a scientific background. My degree is in plant biology with a minor in microbiology. Um, I've never used it, the plant biology portion, but um, I was. I didn't know coming out of my bachelor degree that aging was aging was a problem. I know I knew aging was a problem. I didn't know that people were addressing it directly. Um, I read I like sci-fi. I read a lot of Robert Heinlein, mm-hmm. um, and so there's I just thought it was science fiction. There's studies in there about people living forever and curing diseases and things of that sort, and really innovative, revolutionary tech coming when you consider when it was written when Robert Heinlein wrote these things, um, and. I, it took me reading Ending Aging, which is a book co-authored by Michael Ray, who's currently on staff, and Dr. Aubrey de Grey, who's one of our founders, um, that blew my mind that this research was happening. And so really, that hasn't changed much since I left college in 2000. So um, <laughs> it's, in, it's important, I think, that we, that we showcase to the up-and-coming researchers that this is actually a field that they can tackle. Because a, I don't... I haven't met anyone yet where I, especially in the sciences, where I say, did you know that we're researching this and you can tackle it from a scientific standpoint? And they're like, I'm not interested. 
Like nobody, nobody's like, no, thank you. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in like helping my parents live a better, healthier life or helping my grandmother not get Alzheimer's. Like that's just not something people say. Um, and so part of our goal is to take these, these kids coming out of, well, I guess they're young adults coming out of their bachelor degrees with really not a quite firm idea of what they want to do or what they want to do yet. And saying, you have the scientific background, you know how to work in a lab. Let us teach you about why aging is relevant and how you can, how you can tackle that in a laboratory setting. And we've had some amazing students come through and we don't just put them in-house. We also put them at other institutions in the United States that are working on aging in those laboratories. Um, Evan Snyder is a great lab down in Sanford Burnham that we put a lot of students every year and he just loves our program and we love him and he does great work with them. He did a lot of work in COVID too, actually, which is an age relevant disease. Um, so that's really important. The other thing though, is we do get a lot of these, these people who are maybe just fresh out of school, maybe have been out of school for a really long time who are like, I've learned about what you're doing and I want to do it as well, but I don't have any training. And so we are really interested in creating a way of giving these people some basic understanding of what the aging research we do is from a damage repair approach and why it's important, but also giving them a little bit of a background enough, at least to get them started in the sciences to see if that's something they wanna do, like some basic laboratory training, but also not everything in aging has to do with research. I mean, the research is really important, but a lot of people have skill sets that is relevant to our field that they don't even realize is relevant to our field. And so we're we're trying to encourage those community members to also be involved in the community. Um, I guess I'm a good case in point. I was a scientist and now I am more or less an administrator. Um, so I don't use my science degree, but I'm in the field and I'm, I hope I'm making a good impact. Knock on wood. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're trying to create curricula. So curricula that is online, that is accessible to anyone that isn't wet lab experience, but will teach you the science as well. And we have some of that with our RISE program online, but right now I believe the RISE program is, isn't really accessible to everybody. I think you have to be in an institution and ideally we would make this accessible to everybody. Um, our current director of academic affairs, Dr. Lillian Fishman, is also interested in pushing this down a layer. We've historically only dealt with college students or college graduates, um, but she's interested in, in really meeting high schoolers where they're at and talking to the high schoolers about what we do and why it's important and getting them invested in the space too. And not just from a scientific standpoint, standpoint but also from like a community standpoint of, you know, how do you make a difference? How do you, how do you help people live longer, live better? not just about lifespan, but health span. Um, and so I think the education program in general is, is going to be really expanding, um, but it's another place where we need a lot of funding. I mean, we also take undergraduate students into our laboratories in the summer for a three month internship. And those students are fantastic and great, but it, those students cost us about 9K a summer. The other students cost us probably about 60K for the post-baccalaureates who have a 10 month internship. And we don't get restricted funding for that. But education is such an important part of our mission because we're not just about the research. We're also about developing the community because it takes more than one institution to do this work. It's going to take a whole community of people. It's going to be changing the mindset of all these people. It's going to be teaching our kids and our students that aging is a problem. It's going to be teaching them that you can address it from all areas so that when they become politicians or lawyers or doctors or, I mean, restaurant owners, I mean, anything they want to be, that they are looking at this with that perspective of, yeah, this stuff matters. And so when eventually we get this stuff onto, into Congress or onto a ballot someday, that they're going to vote in favor of aging research. Um, anyway, so it, it takes a, a big community and I'm really excited about our education program. We also have a master's program. We have a master's student in-house. Um, we have another master's student coming, I think in a month, maybe two months time to come to our facilities to work with us. We have a PhD student currently from the UK with us. I'm um, doing work at Replenisense. Um, and we're looking at possibly setting up more inter-institutional inter collaborations to develop a stronger education program. My goal personally is to create a PhD program on aging, on diseases of aging that's targeting aging so that, and not just any aging, let me be very clear about this, damage repair approach to aging because I think we are one of the only, if not the only current institution looking at damage repair, the damage repair model of aging and not just 
genetic modifications and things of that sort, you know, not looking, we're not looking at metabolism. We're not looking at pathology. We're looking at the damage that accrues between, between the, the normal metabolic processes and the creation of the pathologies and disease. And nobody else is really doing that. And I think that that's a really important distinction. And I think we need to educate more people about that because I think it's the way to go. I think it's the way we're firmly in the camp of that's the way we're going to defeat aging. And any other method really is going to take too long or doesn't have the technology to back it up. Not yet anyway. Um, so that's my spiel about education. I'm really, really invested in our education program. I think it's brilliant. And the students we get are stellar. And I really want to see us having more of a boot camp environment where people who are coming from other, other disciplines can really make an impact too. We get so many emails from people saying, I'm a computer programmer or I... Well, computer programmers are a big one. Programmers, web designers, people in tech often ping us saying, I love what you're doing. How can I help? And we don't have a lot to tell them. Um, I wish we had more we could tell them. Mostly just yeah. stay in touch. Yeah, I wish there was like a, like a little decision tree and it's like, I am a person in tech. I am a person who works at a restaurant. I am a per And they can kind of like decision tree out, you know, like uh, choose your own adventure to like how they could help out. And it's like, oh, uh, one way you can help out is by giving $3. I don't know. Or uh, one way you can help out is by uh, uh, starting like a walkathon in your local community where you raise money for a project that you care about. So it could be like a little decision tree where it helps different people who uh, have contacted you a lot based on frequency of frequently asked questions that you get. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, something something that, that would be great, actually. It's a great idea. I'm going to talk to Maria about that. Um, but something that we talk a lot Trademark. about at SR. <laughs> Okay, deal. We'll, we'll name it after you. Um, something that we talk a lot about at SRF is, you know, would a walk, for instance, work for us? And we're like, I don't know, probably not. But if mm -hmm. if there's anybody listening who is associated with like these disease institutions, these dis these very large disease organizations, we're really looking to find ways to like connect with them because a lot of what we do is is directly relevant to some large disease, right? Like we're not talking about often obscure or orphan diseases. We're largely talking about things like atherosclerosis, heart disease, and um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and arthritis. And I mean, there's all these things that are really severe diseases out there that impact so many people. And those are the, and our, our technologies will address them. And so I'd really love to get more involved with these larger disease organizations um, because again, it takes a community and we would love to, for instance, when people do these walks, you see these, I did an Alzheimer's walk for my grandmother, um, a long time ago. And at the end of these walks, you have all these booths, right. And like, you can go visit the booths and somebody's on stage. And I would love to have like a five minute on stage in front of all these people saying, Hey, I, I hear that you're interested in heart disease. So are we, let me talk to you a little bit about why our model of curing heart disease is relevant and why it can make a big impact for you in your lifetime, like in the next five years, your lifetime and, and the impact mm -hmm. of your family as well, and, or have a booth set up just to, just to raise some awareness. And I think um, that would be big, but it's so hard. I feel like to, we're often seen as fringe, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's this idea, you know, we get a lot of people who are transhumanists, who are immortalists. And while I'd say we even have some of those people on staff, right, who are very of that inclination, that's really not where our mission is. Our mission isn't about creating an immortal person. It's not, it's not about uploading our brains to right to get out of our meat sacks. It's it's about making sure that our meat sacks last as long as we want them to in a healthy state that doesn't require um outside interventions from other people, like maintaining your life, right? Like I want. I want to be autonomous for as long as I want to be autonomous, right? I want to live in my own yeah. house, walk up my stairs, right? And that matters. And I want I want my mind to be clear. I want I want to know that I can know who I am and who my family are. And and I think that talks a lot more about health span, right? Health span, not lifespan. Talking about how you can live to be 200 but feel like you're in your 50s or better, right? And and I think that's a different conversation because we're not talking about like if you get hit by a bus we're just going to pop you back to life now at some point that might be able to be possible i don't know but we're talking about like you know eradicating things like cancer and alzheimer's and um and i think that that is going to impact way more people and i think if you say to someone like 
do you want to live to 200? They go, no, that's, that's crazy. And then they, they kind of put us into that category. But in reality, you say, okay, well, do you ever want to die of Alzheimer's? Like, do you, do you, is that, is that what you want to do? Is that, is that where you see yourself going? Or what about a stroke? Do you want to die of a stroke? And they're going to be like, no, no, I don't want to die of that. Okay. Well, what do you want to die of? And everyone's like, oh, I want to go peacefully in my sleep. I'm like, well, that's, that's lovely. But what if like up until you died in your sleep, you were perfectly healthy and, and you didn't have to worry about like your joints and stuff. I have a, I have a grandmother-in-law who I adore who um, plays cards and her knuckles are huge because she has arthritis and that's a disease of aging and it's caused by systemic inflammation and overabundance of senescent cells and all kinds of things that we're addressing internally. And, and I keep thinking like, man, I would love it if like, it didn't hurt her to play her favorite card games. Like that would be great. And those are the kinds of things that we think about a lot internally when we're talking about our mission and our goals. And I wish, I wish people thought of us more in terms of alleviating suffering and prolonging health than they are in terms of immortality. And I think that's, that's been our biggest struggle as an organization is really breaking into the mainstream because we have that stigma of fringe. And while, yeah, we're innovative and yeah, we're saying things that not a lot of other people are saying. And we've been saying this sometimes first, you know, when we started saying this, it was really our people who were saying it first. Um, doesn't mean we're crazy, right? It, it, it doesn't mean that, that we're, we're shooting for something that isn't going to happen. Um, we're making real, real innovative science and we're making it in a way that is re- reproducible and is peer reviewed and is able to um, get through the FDA and through clinic. And I think, um, I think that should matter more than it does, unfortunately. Um, mm-hmm. Well, in, in my opinion, uh, you're not French. You're my, one of my top five uh, nonprofits in the world. And I know a lot, too. That's actually Thank saying something. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> that means a lot. <laughs> yeah, you're like the top two, actually. There's a, a one out in, uh, I, don't, I don't know, you, you fight for this one out in the, the East Coast called New Harvest that does sell agriculture. I like the way they, they run things. They do like a, a sell agriculture related things. So they um have, um have they do like a lot of R&D, like most of the stuff. They've like helped build out the entire industry, which I was like. I like. They're like kind of a, analogous to you guys, but they don't take a percentage. And I, I want to, I want to, uh, so I, I kind of uh, talked to them about that. But um, so I know we're coming to the end. Uh, what books would you recommend? And anyone, honestly, when I think of SENS, I don't think of uh, longevity per se. I think of like health span and like research. So uh, whatever I read, I'll try and like figure out like why I feel that way. And then maybe I can like replicate, you know, it for you guys so you can get it to other people. Uh, you mentioned two books, Heimlin and Ending Aging. Are there other books you recommend people check out either that you love personally? I, as you can tell, I, I read and I need more things to read. So you're helping me. Uh, I I used to read a lot more than I do. Now I read a lot of the books that are coming out in the industry. Um, I have to say, I haven't really been thrilled with anything. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, there's a That's really good. great book on stress. Um, what's it called? Um, do I have it here? Oh yeah. The Upside of Stress. I love that. That's fantastic. It's about harnessing stress for good, basically, and changing how you think about things. And I think that impacts your health as well. It's not related to my work at all. Well, it is about how I function in my in my work. Um, and I've used it to encourage my senior staff more to take better care of themselves because we all work too much. Um, but ending aging is a big one. I love sci-fi and fantasy. So um, so yeah, Robert Heinlein, anything by Robert Heinlein. There's um there's a really great book of his um so the, the main character of his that that talks about longevity and that I think has some really interesting innovation is Lazarus Long. He's like the mm-hmm. main character of the book. And it's Time Enough for Love. That's the title of the book. That's a really great book. And it's actually what got me first interested in longevity. Um, but there's there's a bunch of books out there about, I mean, from people like um about the longevity space. I'm I'm not sure I buy into any of them. And frankly, we need to do an update on ending aging. Um but it's because the, if you go to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to make any friends here. Um, if you, if you go to these conferences, there's a lot of longevity conferences and some of them are really, really interesting. In fact, a lot of them are really interesting, especially if you haven't been to them, but you often see the headliners are, are a lot of the same people. There are a lot of the mm-hmm. same people saying the same things they've been saying for the last five or 10 years. Um, and it's not anything really new or exciting. Um, and then you see these people who are new companies that are presenting and 
they're interesting. Like there's one that does that I actually take. Um, it's from Juvify called Glilo that their science, their data was really interesting about lowering your fasting glucose. And I, my fasting glucose is fine, but my father's diabetic. And so I decided to take it and I actually feel better on it. Um, not that that's a recommendation for anyone to take, but, and I saw, so I, but I saw the, them present their data at one of these conferences, but by and large, most of the conferences that they're posting about are supplements or creams or spa yeah. sessions. And, and I think that for being a longevity organization ourselves and for interested, for being interested in ex- expanding on people's health span, I see these sorts of things and it kind of depresses me because I want to, I don't, I want to go to these longevity conferences and get really excited about the new tech that's going through the clinic and where they're at. And that's not, I mean, we see that sometimes, but by and large, it's like, we're going to bypass the FDA and we're going to give you the supplement that's going to maybe extend your life by two months. And, and I, and I see, and I see these things and I, I mean, even like metformin and things like that, things that are really commonly known as being, you know, to in, increase your lifespan and your health span, they don't do it very much. And while I, I appreciate them for what they are and that, you know, I think, at some point, you're going to want to take these things so that you can live as long as you can, so you can actually hit the next medical technology that's really going to improve your life significantly. Um, I don't know. I just wish there was more out there. And I feel that way about the books, honestly, in our space. Yeah. I feel like yeah, the a, books are a lot of repeat. Yeah, I, the supplements are something that I'm concerned of because they're not regulated. You don't know really what's in them, and you don't know to what extent they're efficacious, for for lack of a word. Like, there, um, I mean, metformin, for instance, I think has some new stuff coming out saying it might encourage, uh, not encourage, uh, uh, increase your chances of Parkinson's. Like, there's, I don't like putting things in my body. Like, I'll take vitamins because, like, you know, that makes sense. Like, I, I'm out on like the Serengeti. <laughs> it's not. Well, well, I try and like so, I try and source for my my diet like the vitamins that I need. But if I don't, because I'm a bum, then I'll take like a vitamin D pill. But even then, I I, I would prefer anything that goes in my body to be regulated by something, like. At one point in time, people would yeah. put like orange juice, for instance. There's a there's a definition of what orange juice needs to have for it to be considered orange juice. And you think, why does that matter? There was a time where they would just fill it up with water and say it's orange juice. And they'd be like, this don't taste like orange juice. Like, well, it, it says orange juice. And people are busy. You know, people were probably busier in the past than they are now with all the things. I mean, the kids had to work and all this stuff. But um, I prefer things to be regulated that I consume, like, as much as possible. But so like I, I, kind of scary. I agree with you. There was I was at a conference recently and there was a guy who said something on stage that I thought was absolutely brilliant. And I wish I had written down his name because I really want to give him this credit for this quote. But it was it was more or less that um, when you're taking things, anything that if even if you're looking at the data of what you're taking, what you're looking at is the data of that one thing going into your body in isolation by and large. Right. It's not telling you what your exact cocktail of medications and supplements are. So you might know what taking vitamin D does, but you don't know what taking vitamin D and vitamin C together do. There's no science on that. Yeah. And so you have to be, it's like there's people at these conferences often who take significant sums of vitamins and supplements to help extend their health and lifespans. Um, But in reality, they don't really know. I mean, what what they're doing is really an N of one. It's a study of them and that's it. And so like, I take vitamin D because I am genetically predisposed to having like vitamin D through the floor. And I know that's important, but I don't really, and I take that, that glilo that I mentioned on occasion when I remember, um, but by and large, I don't, I don't really take anything else because I don't, I like, I like my stuff to be, I like to know what's in it, um, as much as I can. And I like to, um, have some solid science on what it's doing. Um, there's a, there's a thing out too called mitopure. Mm-hmm. That was, I saw their data and I thought it was really interesting about basically removing crappy mitochondrial from your body. And I'm not really sure I buy into the science of it yet. I haven't done as much homework on it as I should, but they talked about it improving cognition. Now, my grandmother passed of Alzheimer's. My mother is having a lot of cognitive issues and is probably headed down the same path, fortunately. Um, and I considered getting it for her. One, it's really expensive. Um, and two, I'm not really sold on the science. And she's also on a bunch of other medication that she has to take for her doctor. And I don't know how would it interact. So while I think that they're on to something interesting, I haven't seen enough of the science yet to actually believe in what they're doing. And I don't know how it interacts with all the other meds. So like, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's worth it. And so I, I have that issue with supplements. I feel like when you're talking about a therapy that's gone through the FDA, that's gone through clinical trial, not saying that the FDA is perfect by a long shot, but 
there's at least some rigor that happens there that lets you know that what is or is not mostly safe. I'm going to say mostly safe because like women's birth control is also through the FDA and it's bullshit, but <laughs> different discussion for a different day. Um, so, um, so I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's hard. I don't, I don't recommend any supplements for anyone ever because I feel like it's a really crap shoot. The only thing I can say if you're about personally what I do to like improve my, my health span and longevity, is two things. One, I take vitamin D and two, I give blood. I donate blood because there is something to be said for the age old tactic of leaching, right? <laughs> um, removing your blood and your old plasma actually does improve your health. Um, keeping your blood iron low, your ferritin low actually does improve your health. So, I mean, those are like scientifically sound. That's like the only thing I've found that I feel comfortable, like really sharing. And I, mm-hmm. and especially if you're a man, that's really important, by the way, to donate blood because you don't have a way of naturally bleeding. Yeah. Iron, right? If that builds up. Yeah. Iron builds up. Your ferritin builds up and it's not good for you. Creates all kinds of problems cognitively, especially cognitively. Hmm. Is that is that why after I took the COVID vaccine, <laughs> spoons would stick to me? I can't say it. I'm sorry. I just think it's funny. <laughs> don't don't eat. Don't even do it. Don't do it. Oh my gosh. I couldn't say oh it. Oh my gosh. I couldn't say it. It was like like uh when I got my COVID vaccines, I would I would text my uh certain family members who felt a certain way about those things, and I'd say I feel like buying Microsoft stock now. Bill Gates is the number one guy in all the world. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my God. There was, um, there was somebody once, I think it was in an interview. I think it was in an interview where they were like, what do you think about vaccines? And I'm like, you, you know, I'm a scientist by training. Right. And I run a, a research organization, right? Like we are, we are 110% pro vaccine and they're like, really a longevity. And I'm like, yeah. And then we were at a conference not too long ago. And I was talking to a gentleman and he was like, I'm not vaccinated and I'm perfectly healthy and I refuse to put that in my body. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I don't, I can't even argue with you at this point. All right. Like, it was nice knowing you. It's, I mean, I I hope you don't get polio. Like, I don't know what to say to these people. So um, polio bothers me. We almost had it eradicated and it keeps coming back because people don't want to take it. No, I know a, a lot of things like that bother me. Um, I have small children and my daughter where she was vaccinated for COVID had long COVID and mm. it was really problematic for a lot of reasons. And then we got, we finally got to the point where we were able to get her vaccinated and we did and it cured her long COVID. And there's all this research that shows, especially in children that the vaccine t- teaches their bodies how to remove the remnants of the virus that is causing the long COVID. And that's, that's what happened in her case. And I know it's an NF1 essentially, but like there's there's a lot of research about that. And I'm just like, every some every time someone's like, how can you put that in your children? And I'm like, well, it saved my daughter. So like, I'm not, I just realized that I wanted to make an obscene gesture and I probably shouldn't do that <laughs> on camera. <laughs> it wouldn't matter to me. You can do it if you want. Uh, so nice. I haven't, I don't know if I've sworn or not yet during this interview, but I, I usually cuss like a sailor, so. Trying to be I don't think so. Or I haven't noticed it. I'm kind of nose oh, blind to that, uh, to swearing. Like I grew up in a household where like every three words were like swearing. And then, but now they pretend that they never swore. So it's like, I don't understand. You know, that, you, I, you know the hypocrisy it it bothers me. <laughs> we, um, we have a rule about swearing in our house, which is it doesn't matter if you swear because words are all matter in context, but you're not allowed to swear at people. Mm. So like um, my son at the age of four was like, um, she's being a little shit. And I was, or she, he called, he called my younger sister a little shit. And I said, you can't do that. She's like, he's like, well, this is shit. And I'm like, well, that's better. Like that's, that's a proper use of, okay, that's fine. You're not swearing at anybody anymore. And so it was, um, that's our rule, but it doesn't mm-hmm. improve. I'm always nervous about going into interviews and um, being a little, um, you know, improper, I suppose. You've been proper. I don't know. I also don't like, uh, I don't measure people by my own stick. I just assess them based on how they view themselves. So, uh, I don't seem good. The, uh, so I know we're, we're going over, uh, I'm just scanning, oh. make sure 
we have a couple of uh, questions, but uh, from guests, from from listeners. But I know we're going over, so I will skip them. And unfortunately, uh, they will have to be answered by someone else. So uh, the uh, you can email me or email use use our website and email questions. I'd be happy to answer anything over. If yes. you use our, so, uh, our web contact form, it's you can just it goes straight to I see them all, and so does our science writer Michael Ray, and we'll answer any questions. Sweet, yeah. Uh, I I could potentially email them and then have the answer scroll down real quick. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, doing the outro, uh, I, I want to thank everyone for coming out today to learn the whole show, learn about Lisa, uh, who is a Kaiser, which is pretty cool as she's leading a great organization, and uh, we can trust people with that title. And um, I just want to thank you so much for coming out, sharing so much of your life and your day. I know we went over, so I appreciate you not yelling at me. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me. This was great. I had a really wonderful time. Yes, that's the official story. So, 